How many of you remember, you're old enough to remember, the old Sears catalogs? Anybody here old enough to remember that? How many of you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about a Sears catalog? All right, you youngins. <laughs> it was the internet of its day, the Amazon of its day. You could find anything in a Sears catalog. And I remember that because I am of that age. I'm 57 years old, and down in Panama, growing up in the Republic of Panama, uh, was one of the things that we actually received in the mail, and it was amazing to look at all that stuff. So growing up in Panama, here's the deal. And by the way, this is our series, Elephant in the Room. Today's topic is sexual immorality in the church. So I'm going to be talking families. You may have your young ones with you. This is the topic here, so I'm glad you have your young ones, but be prepared to uh, process this afterwards. And uh, so full disclosure here. But growing up in Panama, one of the things was, man, I was a red-blooded American boy. And I always dreamed of coming back to America where all the girls were beautiful. And, uh, you know, down in Panama, it was, it was, it was different. You know, the girls, the Teenage girls, they didn't shave their legs or their armpits. I mean, it was just, and so the dream was, was America, where they did shave. And, and, and every, every girl was beautiful. I came, when I was 18, I came up to America. That's when I had my chance, coming to college and so forth. In no small part, the Sears catalog had an impact on me. Because you see, if you recall, back in the late 70s, Sears contracted with Brooke Shields to be one of those who displayed women's undergarments in the Sears catalog. And so as a teenager, I thought, man, they almost look like Brooke Shields, I guess, here in, in America. And as a young boy processing, coming into adolescence and then processing this whole part of my life, I knew that it was part of God's plan. He made us sexual creatures, right? And, and to try to figure that out and to navigate those waters coming up to the point of adolescence and then into adulthood in a way that would honor God. So we're, t we're saying here in this series here, the elephant in the room is, is sexual immorality in the church. And... It may be of surprise to you, but I think not, that there are issues with sexuality for Christians. This is a fact of life. We're going to talk about it here and, 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 and be, try to be quite open as we process here. And we're, going to, we're going to let Scripture guide us as we talk. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 tells us, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. And so Paul here is writing to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus. It was called Ephesus First Assembly of God. And he's telling them, as I stand here now to you, and he's saying to them, there must among you not be even a hint of sexual immorality. So you may be here today and you're thinking, okay, what is sexual immorality? What, what is that talking about? And that's a good question because we, we do need to define our terms. When I grew up in Panama and then there was the Sears catalog and, then, and it was to try to figure out my path going forward. In our, in our home, we didn't talk too much about sexual things. Mom and dad are, you know, Swedish and before they became assemblies of God, my grandparents were Swedish covenant, very conservative type thing. You just didn't talk about those things. And so trying to navigate it and, and, and did fairly well in some respects, although I thank God that the only thing I was exposed to was a, a Sears catalog compared to today where everything is there. For the young boys of today, Ted, back in the 70s, the young boy of today, it's all before them. But I did do this with my boys, that as, as, as they were growing up, we talked about these things a lot. I tell them the stories about me and, and, and being a young kid. And there was this robust sense of dialoguing what these things are, these issues before us. Sexual immorality. That's, and, and I'll give a general term, and then we'll get more specific. But anything outside of God's plan for sex and, his, and what he placed within us as sexual creatures, anything outside of God's plan is sexual immorality. 
And so as we go along here, we'll, we'll, tr- we'll see that be defined more. But our goal as Christ followers is to be like Christ and what God wants for us in the area of our sexuality. That is what every Christ follower should desire, is whatever you say, God, that's what I want. Would you all agree with me on that? You may disagree with me what you think God wants. We may dictate different uh, you know, interpretations of Scripture, but... It is in the area of our own sexuality. It's what God's plan is for our lives. So, so we, can, we can see several areas that, uh, that are very clear in Scripture. Sex outside of your marriage. That's outside of God's plan. That would be sexual immorality. Uh, same-sex attraction. The Scripture is, is clear about that that, they're, that, they're, that. that is outside of God's plan. To, to be unfaithful to your spouse, even before you're married... To be unfaithful to that spouse you will have. That that's outside of God's plan. And, and, there, and so much more. But, but here's what, is the, what we find. And the statistics tell us this. Christians are, are not exempt from the sexual temptations of this world. Christians are not. The stats tell us that within the church, it's, it's prevalent among many that could identify as Christians. And so... What we say every Sunday just about, or what I say about every other Sunday to us as a church, you know what I say. I say, hey, we're just a bunch of messed up people, right? Remember that? We say that when first-time guests and we're greeting them. We're just a bunch of messed up people. And then I say, and you, first-time guests, you're probably messed up also. So let's just be messed up together and discover the grace of God. Because that's all we ever had to begin with, right? So we, we talk about that. And, you know, messed up. And we say, oh, yeah, sometimes I get mad. Oh, sometimes I honk my horn at somebody and I shouldn't have, you know, and, oh, messed up. You know what? Can we be honest? Messed up goes a whole lot deeper for us in our ambitions, in our vanity, in, in selfishness, going into addictions, and even in our sexuality. As a pastor, I can tell you, because I know my people, I know you. I know myself that, man, we're messed up when it comes to sexuality. We're, we're gonna, we're, I'm going to unpackage that onion some here, the layers off of that. But we're all messed up. And we look at it when, it, when Paul says here, not even a hint of sexual morality. It's almost like, are you kidding? Not even the hint of it? And yet this is what the scripture says, so we need to look at it and try to understand. So here's what's happened. Last week, I alluded to Proverbs chapter 7, and that I would be speaking on that today. That, that was, in its entirety, its own message. And so I have offloaded that and taped that and put it on the app. In fact, if we would uh, uh, show this here, that on the, your smartphone, your device, you can have the app, and there's the information about this message today in the message notes, but also down here at the bottom, I put on here, and you can just link into it, online only, it's, it's the Proverbs 7 message. For those of you that maybe are dealing with problems with the internet and with viewing things on the internet that you shouldn't be, there it is. You can look at that, and you'll have a chance. Again, thank God for the internet. It provides tools that we would never have had in the natural, but... The internet also is a whole other area of addictions and of temptations. So be ready for that if you want to. You can look at that yourself. But let's come back, if you would, sound booth to, the, um, to our passage there. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual morality. Such a high bar that Paul gives to the Ephesians. Wouldn't you think? I mean, not even a hint. Some of us here, you're thinking, okay, how can I even be a Christian? How can I even be attending this church? It's not that it's a hint. It's that I secretly am doing things here. I'm looking on the internet. I, I have these thoughts. I, I am, I'm flirting with somebody, a coworker. I, I, I'm, I have, I have not more than flirted. Some of you, you know, you're, you're actively engaged sexually, and, and you have guilt about it, but you want to serve God. You're trying to process this. And then Paul says to the Ephesians, there shouldn't even be a hint of sexual morality. And in case you're thinking, well, okay, 2,000 years ago, they probably didn't have all the things that I'm having to deal with. I mean, this is America. Look at all the, the filth of America that's right there in front of all of us, all the way into our schools and down into and not just high school, but middle school and even into elementary school. And it's all around me. Oh, 
This is about the Ephesians. Well, let me tell you about the Ephesians. Okay, it was a crossroads. It's a major metropolitan area. It was a crossroads of commerce, and they had the goddess Diana that was their major temple there uh, for pagan worship, and the cult temple prostitutes that were available. Let me tell you, Ephesus, if there was any town or city in the New Testament that was like America today, it would be Ephesus, all right? And Paul is saying this, this is, and these aren't, aren't, aren't Jewish believers solely who would have a certain moral code that they would be holding in the midst of this decadent society. He's talking to Gentiles, the church in Ephesus. These are Gentiles who have come out of, they are brand new Christians that have come straight out of thinking it was appropriate, it was part of their life to, 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 to be an evening with a prostitute and that was somehow honoring the, the goddess of, or a god of some type. And, and it was prevalent in their society. And yet Paul says it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that there shouldn't even be a hint, a hint. And there was, sexual morality shouldn't be there in a culture that's over-sexualized. Uh, over how do we live out avoiding sexual morality in light of the reality of our own culture. So we look at scripture and we let God's word guide us. And so I'm jumping around here some, but Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is talking. In Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees are talking to him and and they're asking about divorce, but it really ties into this whole area of our sexuality. And if anyone's thinking, oh, why are they talking about sexuality in church? We should be talking about flowers or knitting or something like that. Well, you know, (laughs) this is what we need to be talking about. This is our lives. And you may be, some of our our older uh, couples or individuals, some of our older ladies, some of our older men, you know, it's maybe past you, temptations, all that type of stuff. But for all the rest of us, man, it's real. And from what I understand in statistics, for, for seniors, it's very real also. This is, what, this is exactly what we should be talking about here. So Matthew 19, the Pharisees are asking, that it's an area of divorce, but, but here's what Jesus says in reply to them. He says, haven't you read that in the beginning, God, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So Jesus, when he is dealing with an area of, in, in the area in the realm of sexuality, it's, it's, it's divorce, but that means that probably the husband you know, doesn't feel like the wife's fulfilling all his needs type of thing, or uh, there's, there's all those components there, and, 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 and the messiness of life, it's right there. The Pharisees put it out there, and Jesus, what he does, he points back to the beginning. God's original plan, remember, sexual morality is anything outside of God's plan for our sexuality. So Jesus points back, and we do well also to do it, to God's original plan. And there's a lot of things very illuminated here in this. You know, male and female is a huge component, whether you like it or not. And, and the younger generations here, you, you get on edge when a pastor like me starts to allude to the sexual morality, and I mention same-sex attraction in the same phrase or, or sentence. But we go to God's word, and we let God's word guide us. He made them male and female, and, and, that, and that, that young person, that young woman, that young man, they leave his or her father and mother and, and, and be married, and they become one flesh. And, and that term, of course, is alluding to the actual uh, you know, the act of sex and that they are one, and spiritually, they're bonded as one. This is, Jesus points to us, he, he sets it up. This is God's plan, and, and it helps us to see this because that's, that's now indications of what God's plan is for you and for me. And the Pharisees in the following verses, they, 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 they ask question, well, then why did Moses say we could get divorced? And he gave the right to do, and all this type of stuff, and getting into the messiness and the weeds of it, just like you would if we were sitting down around a table and we were talking, you could rightly say, well, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? And, and that's true, but Jesus replies, and, and you can look it up yourself in verse 8, he says, you know, Moses permitted you to, to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it wasn't that way in the beginning, he says. Okay, so somewhere along the line, there's this, this ideal, there's this plan. Ideal's not the right word. This plan that God has, he designed us this way. So when my boys were growing up, I talked with them about sex and our sexuality. 
It was something. In fact, what I would use is uh, usually on Thanksgiving, about this time coming up here, there would be a Black Friday, and uh, you know, uh, Best Buy would be having whatever they do, you know, to sell things for a good price. And yeah, and how many of you ever went and you would stay all night standing in front of the store? You're the thirteenth person in line. Anybody did that? None of you. Well, we did that. We did that a lot. Remember, Brian? We would do, that's right. And, uh, or AT&T had their new phone, you know, the, the, the old iPhones. And, and, and I remember one time they're standing, uh, we, we brought, uh, you know, our sleeping bags and our little beach chairs. And my boys and I, we sat all night long, had a little ball and, and baseball, you know, and we would, and that's, those are the times I would use to talk to Brandon, Brian, and Matthew about our sexuality and it was it was so neat because there was no hey can I can I have you for a moment yeah I'm on the video game I know just give me five seconds here (laughs) five seconds to talk about your sexuality no we had all night long and it was so cool Brandon was the first the oldest that's that little junior hire that was up here doing the offering (laughs) now he has two kids I'm like how did that happen and he goes I'll tell you dad (laughs) and we would talk and I would unpackage that layer about God's wonderful plan. And here's the deal. I presented in such a positive thing. I was like, I did not say, so help me if one of you gets somebody pregnant. You are, yeah. oh. I, I talked with them, and I, I won't go through the whole spiel because we had all night to do this, you know, but, but I, if you want to stay, I'll do it. You know, but, but it was to say here, you know, God had his wonderful plan, and everything Brandon, I was first. And then Matthew was neat was when I was telling Matthew about it. Brandon was there. I think that was the time there at the AT&T store at, at South Campbell. And Brandon's there next to me. And every now and then he goes, yeah, you see Matthew. <laughs> and he was, you know, he was as a seventh grader explaining to Matthew. Now, this, see, this is what it's about. But that was neat. He did have a sense. There was a compass with a strong North Star for Brandon already even as a young boy because we talked about these things, that God is the one who invented sex. It's it's amazing how many young people I talked to and said, hey, who who invented sex? Satan, yeah, because they know, because it's such a bad thing, right? Sex is a bad thing. And they hear from the church, you know, you're not supposed to do it. It's like, wait a minute, we messed this all up. God invented it. Our sexuality, that's what God intended. He, he created that. There must have been something good in the beginning. God created us, male and female. He put all the parts together. It's, it, is, it is exactly what his plan was. So there must be something good. And as I'm talking with my boys, and I talked early enough before they, before they were hitting these issues. Because if you don't, parents, if you... Don't tell your kids about sex and sexuality. They will learn it all at school and from their friends and from teachers and sex ed class. I think here in Missouri, it's a little more conservative, the sex ed classes, but from California where I came from, it goes over everything and every type of probable combination of filth, everything. It's explained and it's, and it's actually gone over. Someday it may come here. And maybe it is here. I don't know. I haven't checked into what the Springfield Public Schools, how they, how they do their curriculum. But, but someone is going to teach your kids. They will learn it. Brandon and Brian and then Matthew is able to talk through and say, this is God's plan. It's something very wonderful. And I, and I talked about how it's a gift that we have. God gave us as a gift that we give to our spouse someday. And I said, Brandon, someday you will, you will find a beautiful girl who will be your wife. And it'll be your gift that you will give that you will be able to keep this thing that is so precious that God has designed and you'll be able to have that with your wife. And and it walked all through that and explained how it was. It wasn't like, so help me, you better not get someone pregnant or don't you do it. It It was a yes type talk that we had. Not no's, it's yeses. This is something special to keep. And, and I, I believe my boys have followed that path. And I believe they're blessed because of it. And, and this idea that God has made us sexual creatures, it wasn't something that, that God said, oh my goodness, what have I done? It was, this is beautiful. God saw what he created and what did he say? It was very good. And by the way, when I'm talking with, with older 
you know, adults that are going to get married and, and uh, maybe they've been living together or they've had sex before. I mean, one of the things I say that, that are coming up to perform the wedding and everything is, is to say, okay, here's what we're going to do here. It's, it's three months out. You guys need to stop living in the same home. Oh, we can't do that. We can't afford another. They go, do you have family nearby? Well, my brother said, can you sleep on the couch for the next three months at your brother's? Well, I guess I could do that. So, great. Now, here's what you're going to do. And they stop having sex for those three months. I say, if you'll do that, and if you'll honor God, this is the step you're taking here. If you'll do this, man, when you come for that wedding vows and then your honeymoon night, it'll be as if it's the first time for you. And God will honor you in it. In other words, God's redemptive, his grace. It's not just for a young uh, boy like Brandon that his dad's talking to him. It's for, it's for all of us. What we're hearing today, you're not saying, oh, well, this is, I guess I've messed up already. No, nope. here we are. This is us being able to learn something. Some of you here, maybe, you know, by 360 house, young men or women or teenagers that are part of the youth group or young adults or anyone here you, this you may no one ever sat there you did not have a dad who said look at this is God's beautiful plan so here I am being your dad to you and here we are unpackaging this because the enemy he twists everything all around the enemy has taken the area of sexuality and in our own sin the Adamic nature meaning of Adam the first one who sinned, and we all have been sinners, that sexuality is one of those areas that's just been twisted around so that we, we're almost lost unless the word of God guides us and God by his spirit guides us. So we can identify some things. You know, someone's married and they're having sex outside of marriage. We say, oh, that's wrong. That person is wrong, whatever. Uh, Same-sex attraction. We cert- certain things, we say, oh, look at that. It's all terrible. Let me tell you this here. Anyone here who looks over their nose at someone and says, oh, look at that sexual sin on their part, we forget what the scripture says, okay? We're all messed up, okay? I'm not trying to equalize various types of sins, okay? That's not the purpose of this. But we all are messed up, okay? In fact, Jesus, he totally goes for this in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, he says this because people are, oh, adultery, look at it. They should be stoned, that's what the Pharisees, the church leaders of their day, religious leaders, oh, this woman was caught in adultery, and it was always the woman to be stoned. What happened? Why, why not stone the guy? But anyway, they, and, and oh, they, you know, stone her. She was caught in adultery. And, and here's the stuff that Jesus would say back to him. It's very revolutionary. It should be for us too. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, Jesus says this, I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And he sets the standard. So my, hey, you're looking down your nose on someone who actually acted out on some of their thoughts. But I'm telling you, Jesus says, if you just even think it, you're, you're guilty of the same sin. And he sets the standard, not that he's saying, I'm going to make this so high that everyone here will just give up on trying to, to achieve the goal I've set. That's not what Jesus, Jesus is saying. Here is God's original plan. His plan for our sexuality is not that you simply don't have sex with that other person, but that in your heart, you're not. And that's where it it touches every single one of us because our minds can be some of the most fertile porn film companies in the world. Or if it's not porn, simply the attraction that we may have towards someone else outside of our marriage. And Jesus says, hey, here it is. It's a common ground, equally at the foot of the cross. It's what it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there's no one righteous, not one. And he's quoting from the Old Testament, Paul writing to the Romans. There's no one righteous, now, I'm not trying to say, everyone here, you're all guilty, and I'm too guilty of all these terrible things. You know what I'm saying, okay? I've lived my life, Robin and I, it was the first for us, we never, outside of our marriage, have expressed our sexuality. And my boys, I believe they've, 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 they've lived it right too. And many of you, you've also lived it right. But I'll be the first to say, I am a sexual human, and I am guilty, along with everyone else. 
All right, so if I can say that, please let us all collectively so that we can lower this bar of looking down our nose at others. Let's say, God, please help me. I wanna live my life as best I can. Church, we, we rightly condemn the things we see in society that are going from God's word, same-sex uh, attractions and, and all these things, but we see what the Bible says. All have sinned and fallen short. All of us are messed up. So, Christian parents and with one another, we pastors, we're gathering together, we're deciding for sex education that we want to have, make available through the church for our, for our kids as, as parents decide. It should always be the parents that decide these things and wh- whether you want your kids to be involved. But as we're looking at this, we're wanting to be able to make this dialogue, take it from the shadows and to bring it out. Because one of the approaches for parenting, and if you have young kids, hear me here, one approach is to keep them so protected, that hedge around them so protected that they are that they don't know much about it. It's just kept secret and they're never exposed to it. And the fact is the day will come when they will be exposed. It will happen and it will probably then be outside of the nice channels that you would like to expose it in. So that's why Ted talked to his sons overnight at a Black Friday special and was able to unpackage all the components of it before the onslaught took place in their lives. Obviously, age appropriate every step of the way. If we wait till they turn 18 and then they go off to college, they are alone to try to figure out every component of that sexuality. We need to be talking about it. We need rescued. Parents, all of us together. So here's the answers that come from Scripture. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, which is not on the screen, verse 31, he quotes again what Jesus quoted, which comes from the Old Testament, which was, the, which was what God said, for this reason a man will leave his mother and his father and be united to his wife. The two will become one. Okay, that passage, right? There it is. And then the very next verse, Paul, now this is the Ephesians, okay? This is the same people. They're in the goddess of Diana and all that, that, that metropolitan area they lived in. He says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. So going all the way back to the beginning, he quotes, and then, and then there's, this, there's this amazing component here about being united with the wife, the two become one. There is a sexual component here, and then he likens that to Christ in the church. And commentators could try to say, oh, well, he's referring to this way that husbands and wives are nice to each other. You know what? Let, I'll let just scripture speak for itself. They did, the two became one that there is something very special. We have, even in the church, gotten this approach to sexuality that's just basically, at its very core, it's, it's kind of dirty. And so the very thought that we would say Christ in the church has this as the analogy can't be right. I say it's absolutely right. It's God in heaven who created us exactly with our sexuality. Now let's discover what his plan was and see how we can live it out. So here are the action steps I want us to follow. Number one action step, let's love everyone wholeheartedly. And here's what I mean by that. We love everyone wholeheartedly. Sometimes as a church we've been guilty of looking down our nose at other people and certain blatant sins and we we just, and then they're bad and we treat them that way. Or we're worried that they will influence our kids and so we just really exclude certain people and what I'm asking us as a church is would we be willing to love people wholeheartedly that means even if they're if they're not correct in how they're expressing their sexuality same-sex attractions or couples living together that aren't married or uh, you know other types of expressions we need to learn how to love them wholeheartedly this, this wonderful thing that Jesus did, which he came full of grace and truth. And I pray that it will be the case here, that we as a church, that we would, you know, we say belong, believe, become. We say belong before believe. That's intentional. It's part of our mission statement. Come and belong. We don't mean to, with the spiritual church. No, you, someone's not even a Christian yet. But they could come and feel like we love them. And they belong and then belief comes from that because they are actually part of a group of people and they say I can't believe it you knew the things I was doing sexually and you still love me the little ladies in the church still came up and gave me a hug and you knew it 
I'd like to love that Jesus who would love the way you would love as a church. And here's what Paul says to the Corinthians, a very another carnal town, 1 Corinthians 5, 9. He said this, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all, meaning the people of this world who are immoral. In other words, he wrote a letter and the church said, okay, everyone. And, and they started avoiding all the pagan, you know, deviant sexual people of their city. And Paul's writing it back and says, hey, hey, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean about people in this world. They need the love of Jesus. You need to be their friend. You need to love them and you need to associate with them. He's saying, what I was talking about are people in the church who blatantly are, are, are living uh, sexually in sin and they're blatant about it. And he mentions another point where somebody marries his his, his, his father's wife. It was just blatant things that even the pagans didn't do, he said. That type of thing is that's where we don't associate. But here, here's the scripture telling us, man, we do need to associate with people who, who are lost in their sexuality, okay? Because we're, we're not lost maybe as far as they are, but we also are trying to find our ways. And, the, and, and as we do that, that, let's love one another wholeheartedly. So in our old church, this was at, across the, the highway here, and, and, and at Park Crest Assembly of God is what we once were, and then we bought this building and, and renovated it. And 18 years ago, the first few months that I was here at this church and pastoring, and there was a young couple that came in, and uh, their, I think their first Sunday was uh, the, like the second Sunday that Rob and I were here. And they were living together, going to MSU. I think it was SMS in those days. And they, and they were uh, not married. And they came in, and they just loved the church, and people were so nice to them, and, and, it was, and, and they, they fell in love with Jesus, and it was so exciting. And about four months later, it was down here in the corner, here in the front row, after church, and when they, they wanted me to come over, I came over and, and sat down with them, and they said, oh, we are so excited about everything that's happening. He goes, we want to become members of the church. And I said, wow, that's wonderful. And I started going over the things with them. And, and I said, so here's the deal. You know, you guys are living together and you're not married. And to become a member, that's not God's plan. That is a requirement we have that you can't be living in sin. We need to be, if, you, if you're going to be together and united, you need to be married. And their faces fell. And the man, he kind of was processing, but the, the woman, and I won't give their names or anything, but she did just young, just a young couple. Her face fell, she began weeping. Oh, I knew there was some catch to this. Oh, she said, and she ran crying out the door, out through the front, got in the car, and they drove away. I thought I would never see him again. You could almost think, man, why bring up stuff like that? Just let them become members. Or what? No. No, there are standards. God calls us to be holy, and there are the standards. It's absolutely right, but it needs to be done in love, and I tried as much as I could to, to love them in that moment. The next Sunday, their car pulled up, and they walked in the church. One of the greatest days of my life to see them walking in, and they walked up to me, and they said, we thought this through, and we know you're right. We want to get married. Would you marry us? And they did the thing of splitting up until the wedding. What a glory. Some of you know who I'm talking about. What a wonderful wedding. They, they moved out to California a couple years later, and they're serving God. And, and, but, but it was this point of loving them first and then seeing God change their lives, never compromising the truth, but, but loving people. And through all this, by the way, talking to my boys often about this and, 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 and processing with them so that they learn these things. Action step number two, in our battle, let's fight with God's power. Okay, all of us, some of you in a great way, you have such a battle in the area of the sexuality and, and you're trying on your own. Let's call in the big guns, man. Let's, it's, 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 it's Jesus and God and his power. I remember, and Dan said, I could say, Dan, Pastor Dan, uh, there was a, years ago, there was a huge rainstorm, and his basement of his house just became flooded. It was like seven inches of rain, and he called. I came over to his house, and he and I, with buckets, were trying to get this, because it, it, it's just flooding his basement. Well, you, you know, buckets with seven inches of rain in, in, a, in a, his huge basement, whatever. There was no way. And so Dan and I, we, we stopped doing what we were doing, and we called in the big guns, man. They, came, they brought in these big 
pumps, generators, big suction things, and boy, they sucked that baby dry in just a, in just a few hours. They, well, not dry, but sucked it down to where all the, the water was gone and, 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 and it could be fixed and healing could take place for the house. We need to call in, man, we need those big solid pumps. You know, you and your struggle with a bucket trying to figure out, oh, let me see if I can get this. Oh, it, it's going to overwhelm you. Man, the floods will come of those temptations. We need to call in the big guns. That's fighting with God's help. So here's, here's how this works, okay? In fact, put it up on the screen there. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. This, this one thing here I say to you can transform some of you. It'll transform your whole life for eternity for some of you. And it's what I do. Jesus said, here's what you're supposed to do every day. It's the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer. And one of those parts is give us this day our daily bread. And we know what he means, right? Jesus said things in, in short little things so they, you could remember them. And then you could do it every day. You could pray his prayers because we could remember the little short frame. Jesus wasn't meaning, hey, our daily bread. And he's like, Jesus, please give me bread. Boy, today could it be, could it be white bread? You know, or could it be, you know, sourdough? Or it, he, he was talking about what we need to sustain us, right? And the food we need. In there, he's including, you know, drink and, and other types of fruits and vegetables and so forth, right? And you understand that our daily bread, he wasn't just talking about food. It's, he's talking about the things we need in life, you know. You know, uh, God, today, you know, friendships that I need. God, give me some strength mentally to be able to get my job done. That we're to ask God. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, right? The scripture tells us that. It comes from God. So, and God says, you have not because you ask not, Right? So we should do this every day. God, help me. Give me what I need for my body. Sustain me physically, you know, with the food I'm going to have. And then this shelter over my head. God, please, every day provide for me and relationally and emotionally and all these type of things. Because God made us physical beings with hunger, right? He made the tummy. And we get hungry. And then we're emotional beings. So he, 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 we can ask because he made us emotional beings. We need friendship. So God brings someone. Some of you, your, your kids in, in, in the youth group, and they're lonely because they don't have a, that close friend. It's just those, one of those quirks of the age groups and how many are there. And you need to be praying every day, God, please bring the daily bread for my little one. God, a, a friend to have in the youth group and so forth. Okay? So all these things are what we have the right to ask. And we're foolish to not ask it. Jesus told us to. For years, I have prayed every day, every day of it. I go through this and God gives us daily bread. God, what we need financially for Robin and me, for our retirement, the retirement home someday we'll buy. God, you'll provide it. God, the friends that we need, all these type of things, I go over and I say, God, and provide for me sexually today. See, God made us physical beings with tummies, right? He made us sexual creatures which means we have the right to ask of God that he will provide what we need sexually. So many of you are looking everywhere else for the bread that you need in that area instead of the one who actually created the sexuality within you. You need to every day ask God, God, today help fulfill me sexually today in your perfect plan. Whether you're married or not, this is, this is, this is your right to ask. And then you may still mess up because we're messed up people, right? We mess up, we sin every day. Till the day you die, you're going to sin. I don't mean sexually, but in some way you're going to sin. And, and sexually, there will be thoughts that will come in your mind. There will be these things. But you know what? You come right back the next day and you ask. And day by day, as you ask, God in heaven will answer. And you will see yourself digging out of your hole and coming into victory. Every day, bring in the big guns. Fight with God's power. And our last step we're gonna take will be at the end when we're all gonna stand together, we're gonna make a declaration together. But right now I want you to bow your heads if you're here and you're hearing about this God and for the first time maybe you're hearing this thing that God's the one who created the whole sexual component of our lives and that kind of blows your mind to think that that would be because sex has always been this idea and the church has always kind of spent this like it's dirty and it's messed up unless you are prude and you just don't do anything and, and then they're not having any fun. The fun of sexuality God planned for those who do it right with their own spouses. Oh, we have no idea 
how awesome it is what God created because the world is twisted all around. But you hear about this God who's actually so cool that he invented sex and you're thinking, man, I'd like to know a God like that. I'd like to serve a God like that. I, I, I need help. I need rescued. If that's you, in any part of our lives, I'm, I'm not talking just about sexuality. I just mean in our lives, we need God. And if that's the case for you and, and you would like to give your life over to Jesus, wherever you are, heads are bowed, but I'm looking, just lay, lift your hand right now. Say, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Others here. I'm looking here slowly. Thank you, my friend. God bless you. Others, lift your hand up so I can see it. Anyone else? Come back around here one more time. Auditorium 2. Those at home also. Anyone else? I see your hand. Thank you so much. God bless you. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to pray this prayer together. You repeat after me in a strong voice because God in heaven, he loves you and he has such a plan for you. Here's what we're going to say. So repeat after me. Jesus... I know I need a savior. On my own, I can't win. So come save me. I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life. Please take over my life. Thank you for being my Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask altar workers if you would come, the prayer leaders if you would come up to the front here, and here's what we're going to do here. If you raise your hand, please come. Don't walk this path alone. These ones are coming up to the front here. You can pray with them. They even have a special book that they'd like to give you as you're now walking this new journey. We're going to walk it together, and in a moment when we come to it, it's appropriate, you come up or you can come up right now and talk with them. But here's the deal. On the app... There are resources, including a resource to the book entitled At the Altar of Sexual Idolatry by Stephen Gallagher. Some of you, you need to go on there. There's the link there. You can look at that, and you need to follow up on that in your own life, okay? And here's our last one, step number three. It's a call to action, and everyone stand up with me on this, would you? And if you're at home, I want you to stand up also. Auditorium 2, you stand up. And this is what we're going to do here. We're going we're gonna to claim this here. I'm going to say it so that you know it before you say it here. It says here, we will stand with God's word and God's way no matter what the world says. And if we're going to be Christ followers, that means he gets to call the shots. Not us. We pick and choose. Well, in this new era, I don't think the Bible's right about this, so I'm going to go this route. As a church, let's stand with great love and grace, but let's say it, we will stand with God's word. No matter what the world may say, we stand with God. I think it's pretty powerful and it can be changing for all of us. And so I want you, if we would, we're all gonna say it in a good, strong voice together. Ready? We will stand with God's word and God's way no matter what the world says. Lord Jesus, we claim it. We say this not to be defiant and we're gonna just fight people. No, we say it with hearts full of love. That, Lord God, when we come to people that are following into sin and they, and they don't even know it, and they're defiant, God, our way is going to be like Jesus, where we go to the prostitute and we love on that person. We go to the tax collector or the sinners, and, the, the, and, and Jesus loved on them. And yet he, tell, he told the truth. He followed God's way no matter what the world said. As a church, we claim that. We're going to live that out. And God, there's going to be such love we're going to show to those who come in our midst who are lost in their ways sexually. We're going to love on them. And their preacher is going to speak the truth. And the combination of that is going to be life changing. It's going to transform everything. God, help every one of us here to know your original plan in our sexuality and to walk in that no matter what the enemy says. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. God bless every one of you. We got pizza with the pastors. For those of you that are new, come on out. We're going to have that time together. God bless you as you go.